I switched to this rotary, it works so fast and so efficient that it just kind of did away with that and with all the adjustments and all that stuff. So yeah, I'm totally open to talk about um, the machine because I, I used coils up until about almost two years ago, year and a half ago. Cheyenne wanted me to try their stuff for probably two years. I got kind of bombarded by them at shows and a lot of my friends used them, but all the friends that did use them were the ones that were doing soft portrait style and I've been steering away from that for like the last um, six, seven years and I wanted to, I wanted, I'm trying to do like an, a legitimate tattoo. So um, I really just tried to, I was trying to get that tattoo look. So I didn't want to use them. Um, once I did, or I guess once they came out with this machine, that's what kind of switched me was I was at a show and um, everyone using them were all the soft people. And uh, I tried it and I liked it for that, but they told me, they guaranteed me. And when I got the machine, he said, you can send this back if you don't like it. He goes, I'll take the whole kit back. He goes, but uh, he goes, you can line with this. And I went home and you can line with this machine amazingly. Um, that's what switched me up. This machine, honestly, though, for me, it's perfect. As perfect as anything I've ever used. Don't be alarmed by the inside wrist. It's not an indication of how the whole session will be. So for those watching, We've got two different techniques going on here. I usually lay my pieces out with a small magnum like this, sort of shade them in. And Jeff is a guy that loves to line. So all the water, he's going to be doing more of a traditional approach for laying it out. Oh, you know what? I don't have a, I don't have a rinse cup. That would be good. Yeah, if somebody could hook me up with a rinse cup, that would be. There you go. set up in your own space it's such a mindless thing you know you've done yeah. it a million times um, Ben the uh, monitor here is still just showing that wave thing So how would you describe the sensation of two machines at once? Um, where you're working right now with uh, more of a pinch and uh, downward dress work with more of a dragon. So it's just interesting making my mind jump back and forth between the two areas. Yeah, we're also working with very different techniques. Yeah. I mean, he actually is literally doing a dragging poke. Yeah.
So Ben, right now, uh, is there a little bit more space for people to stand closer without uh, anyone getting in the way? Absolutely. And what about off to the sides, like over my shoulder? How close is too close? Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, five maggots. Pretty dinky. It's about the size and shape of one of those uh, calligraphy pens. So as long as you're going for a fairly bold line, it works pretty well. Uh, I always come back afterwards with a liner and sort of sharpen it up. But I like this because you can kind of line and shade at the same time. And for this kind of organic-y sort of stuff, this dimensional organic stuff that I like to do, a really good way of uh, doing the first pass and always add um, sharper edges later on in the session. It might seem like sort of a backwards way of doing it, but uh, you know, you can go from general to specific. You know, as tattooers, we're used to working the other way around where we get an outline down, which really like is a very defined way of, of laying down the, the first pass. And that's great for certain things like the water that Jeff's doing right now is uh, a great example of that because it's, it's so line oriented to begin with, it wouldn't make sense to shade it first. I've or, tried that and it never looks right. Well, if it's, if it's the wrong kind of work, it won't look right. I mean, if I were doing waves, I would, I would mag them in. It would be a much different look. Then I'd end up adding the bold out, uh, outlines around the parts that I wanted to have come forward the most. And then, you know, some kind of middle weight lines in other places.
we're both working at the same time, it almost feels like the, the spot closes together. Hmm. So when one pulls off, then the completely jumps to more where it's at. Right, right. That's that's what I was talking about earlier. You you kind of get more of a general sense of pain than two specific points of pain. Yeah. Which in some ways is almost easier. I guess I could share a little background about this piece. Uh, Matt approached us about it. You know, we would put out feelers to try to find the right uh, person to get a collaborative project from us. And so we just kind of asked people to tell us their ideas. And uh, Matt asked for a Heiki crab. I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, it's this Japanese crab that uh, it's in the same harbor where this terrible battle between two feudal clans took place in the late 1100s. And the Heike clan were decimated, and the survivors threw themselves into the, the water, um, with the exception of a few uh, surviving women who settled in the surrounding fishing villages and started families, and eventually they started having a festival there. And so there was this legend of these, these samurai warriors who had thrown themselves into the harbor. And meanwhile, there are these crabs, and some of them had these kind of samurai warrior faces molded into their, their shells. And so fishermen would just throw those back because they kind of figured it was like the spirit of the, the heiki, uh, you know, embodying these crabs. And uh, because of that, natural, I mean, uh, artificial selection took place and uh, the crabs that looked the most like samurai warriors survived and had more babies. And now that you've got a harbor full of these crabs, with these kind of anthropomorphic features. And so that's what this is. We've just thrown on a little bit of uh, extra stylization. And uh, what we're doing here is we're, we're going to be combining this more uh, realistic, organic model kind of look with the crab and the surrounding rocks with this much more traditional approach with the, the waves. Should be a really nice uh, combination of effects. For those familiar with Robert Williams' work, you know, he's always combining these, like, multiple different graphic styles in, in, uh, in his pieces, and it just makes for a very dynamic look. I've always appreciated when tattooers find ways of doing that. But anyway, because we were collaborating on uh, drawing, and uh, we wanted to do a lot of that process in person, we just had... Uh, Matt sent us some uh, pictures of his arm, and I did a couple of very rough layout sketches, and when we met this morning, we all kind of looked those over and talked the idea through, and uh, Jeff did a first pass on this uh, crab drawing after we'd kind of figured out the, the size and placement of it, and after he'd done that, I kind of took a, a, an additional pass on it, changed up a couple of things, and made a stencil while, uh, while Jeff did a... a free hand pass on, uh, on Matt's arm to draw out some of these waves. Then we added the stencil and sort of combined the two. Did a little bit more drawing around it and erasing and adjusting. You know, doing a sleeve like this can be a complex project and it's nice when you can have just a big stencil you can lay for the whole thing, but free handing does allow you to uh, make it fit and flow on the arm a lot better. And uh, in the case of this collaboration, it gave us a lot more flexibility in terms of uh, adjusting the, the design and how it works so that we could uh, really try to get the, boast of, uh, the best of both of our uh, input into the piece. So Jeff, are you a guy that doesn't talk when you work? Uh, not too much. <laughs> Not when I'm outlining, I think. 
thinking a lot about it. <clears throat> I like the I like the idea of what we're doing as far as putting. I'm always afraid of the word traditional because I don't feel like a traditionalist. So it's not traditional in the sense of it's not going to look like an old school tattoo. It's not going to look like a traditional block print. But we're adding the traditional element of you know of outline like the simple ingredients of outline, solid black, and then color. Oh, and also versus just dimensional and textured and stuff, which you don't see in quote-unquote a traditional Right, right. Work. That, that completely uh, changes up any, any you know, way that it, it could be perceived. You know, it's, it's going to stand out as being uh, you know, very tactile and that sort of thing. Right. But because of that, it's going to stand out that much better against the... Uh, the way that the waves are done. It's not just the outline, there's a, although there's some of your personal stylization, there's definitely a lot of uh, very traditional influence in the way that you drew them. Yeah. For me, Corey Flatmo was the first one that I ever identified as someone that did that clearly. It was like, oh man, he put like tattoo style with dimensional stuff, you know. Framed Realism. In, yep. in dimen like volume with a tattoo. Mm. To me, you know, tattoo meaning having that flat aspect to it. That so. graphic. Yeah. And that could look like, yeah, it's graphic. It's flattened out and design oriented deliberately than, yeah I love it it's just something that you can explore you know kind of an endless an endless way of approaching that concept well you know the fact that you can combine and find all these middle grounds all these spaces in between uh, the absolutes of being right. totally experimental or totally traditional or, uh, you know, anywhere in between. Yeah, I think it's, that's all super popular right now. You see it a lot of different ways, but you can always identify it as pretty much the same formula. Yeah, but each person is trying to find their own twist and right. so it gives them, a, you know, kind of a groundwork for laying that over. Yeah, I think once you identify it, then you can look at, like, how could I do this different? How could I adjust that? Or push and pull? Uh, the variances between them. Yeah, there's... I, I like the idea of pushing and pulling because there's so many places where you can do it. You can do it, like, you know, just with your darks and lights. Or you can do it with... Uh, you know, trying to make your big shapes a little bigger and your smaller shapes a little smaller. You know, there's all these places where you can make adjustments like that and really change your overall look and character while still working in the same formula. get this little yeah. area. I won't get the leg yet. I can start shading through here. Okay. Too. So with the intentions of pushing and pulling, we're going to try to... We're keeping the water black and gray. So outline black and gray. Not so much texture. There's right. going to be volume. But right, because of so the much. dark background and lighter foreground and that kind of thing. But yeah, the uh, <coughs> like sculpting and modeling is something we're going to keep in the rocks and the crab. And maybe go, you know, even more simplistic than normal with, with the waves.
someone do me a favor? Go ahead and snag a pair of gloves and move the trash can into here. I think that would be much more advantageous. And you might have to lift it up and over. And then get the pedal facing in this direction. If you could rotate it just a little bit more. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, much better. Are you interested in fielding any audience questions yet, or do you want to wait yeah, for a little bit? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Gabe, anyone got any questions for us? Yeah, let's see here. We got a whole bunch rolling in. The uh, chat room is pretty crazy. I'm trying to keep up as best as possible. Um, let's see. How about how will you two keep your styles balanced? You have very different styles and. How, do you, well, how's that gonna, how are you going to keep it balanced? I think it'll be a natural fit, yeah. you know. Um, I think we chose this project because it does uh, allow both styles to, to sit alongside each other. And, um, you know, roughly equal area between, you know, the, the really model stuff and the really simplistic stuff. And it was laid out. You know, in kind of a back and forth way, so. Yeah, that's actually one of the more important things in, in a good collaboration is to make sure that there's enough intermixing during the drawing process and plenty of communication at that stage. So that as you're passing the drawing back and forth, you're explaining what you just did and what you think it needs and uh, any other ideas that might have popped into your head. and you know, get each other's feedback and um, sort of explore it a little bit more that way, you know. I think we get really habitual about how we work. And that's one of the reasons why I've always liked to collaborate with people because it's a chance to step outside of the, uh, the normal habit comfort zone. I think as long as there's a healthy respect between the people involved that um, it does happen naturally where you're not going to overstep because you respect the person you're working with and so you let them be themselves and you just have this attitude where you're only going to you're only going <clears> to <throat> contribute what you're capable of contributing to make it better. Right. And it's not a contest to, at all. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely am looking forward to working on the waves, but it's with the understanding of the look that we're going for. I'll be doing a second layer over what you're uh, starting, and I'll probably just end up... Uh, smoothing and deepening some of the shading and doing that kind of thing. But working with the idea of this uh, more stripped down kind of graphic approach to it. I think it's, it's important that in any really strong collaboration that both parties work all areas of the tattoo, at least some. Because you do get a better mix that way, and you get some more unexpected things happening. Right.
Right now I'm working with a bunch of sort of muted neutral tones where someone might normally use gray wash but because this is going to be a you know a colored area here and I'm trying to do do this all in one pass I wouldn't want to put color over gray wash in the same session you know it just ends up beating up the skin and getting a sort of muted uh, healed result I find that you get a really rich palette of grays working with with these kind of neutral, neutral colors or even like dipping into colors that are a little brighter but letting them mix with grays and that sort of thing to calm mm -hmm. them down. So I barely ever work with gray wash anymore except for occasional background stuff. Yeah, unless it looks, unless you're really tr going for an intentional look, it looks empty yeah. next to color. I do like doing black and gray bio every now and then. I don't get asked for it very often. Got the uh, the left arm is uh, Aaron Kane and, uh, and Grime, which is really a, an incredible experience. That was two 10-hour days in a row with them both working. Um, I think that's the only collaborative work I've got on me um, I can think of. But uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of work from Don McDonald, and some of the design work on that is collaborative between him and me because I was just I was going for a look that was kind of like my own stuff. Got uh, Nick Baxter piece, uh, a rework of an older piece, but it's, you know, I don't even think of it as a rework, it's just such a strong piece. Had a bunch of work from Eddie Deutsch from back in the, uh, the 90s, some really classic bio stuff, graffiti piece. Um, a lot of work from Greg Culls, he's a kind of experimental abstract San Francisco based artist who keeps a pretty low profile these days. Um, another uh, large piece from Aaron Kane, a non-collaborative one. Marcus Pacheco, another large piece from him. Uh, some work from Dino Cook. Um, Steve Morris did a rendition of one of my own paintings on my leg. A large piece, really nice. Um, then there's a lot of names. I'd have to think almost too much because I'm concentrating on this tattoo to like pull all the older pieces, but I've probably got about 40 artists on me. My lower legs are not carefully laid out, you know, they're just kind of collector areas and I like how they look, you know, I don't really worry about that. They get, if you're going to collect a bunch of messy little pieces, that's the place to do it. I've also been extensively lasered. Had four sleeves done. Hmm. And Jeff, you've got large shige work. And uh, what else? Um, little stuff besides that. I have my back done by shige, and then uh, my first sleeve was done by Corey Norris. Okay. And I've had piece work done by Bob Tyrell and. Um, uh, Joe Harrison, um, Jason Butcher, uh, Mike Godfrey worked on me a little. You can't think about that stuff in tattoo. I know, it's, it's kind of hard. I can think about tattooing while I tattoo. <laughs> So 
My most profound piece was definitely getting my back done by Shige because it was in Japan and it was such a kind of um, such a huge adjustment culturally and every, you know for, in every aspect to go to Japan and get that done. Right, which also so. meant um, doing guest spots there. Yeah, every time I went it was life changing. I'd like to mention to viewers that uh, my wife, Michelle Wartner, and I, we uh, interviewed Jeff about his experience in Japan. Uh, Hypercast number six at our YouTube channel, Tattoo Television. Um, and uh, it's a long format, hour long interview with Jeff showing a lot of his art up close and glittering high def. <laughs> um, so, yeah, some other day besides today. Check it out. Or tonight, after this, if you're not, go glade out. It's a, uh, it's a great interview, and he talks a lot about the uh, kind of the balance between design philosophies that we were just talking about earlier. And his own search for uh, a comfortable place in between. Um, I don't know, what, what's always kind of stood out to me about Jeff's work is, you know, he's got all these different influences and he's obviously very influenced by the, the traditional Japanese style and then in some ways is working to incorporate that more but there's this other stuff in there that, that's a little bit harder to pin down some of it's obviously kind of nouveau influenced a little bit storybook-esque uh, Arthur Rackham kind of stuff but uh, it's got the, the twist to it you know and, and I think that when it comes down to it, when you mix enough influences like that, that's when it really starts to become your style. I mean, that's when, when, when you see Jeff's work, you know that it's his work at a glance, even though it has all these different influences and it. it's definitely gone through the Jeff filter. But yeah, he's, he's tattooing my hand in a couple of days. It's going to be a wave and it's going to be some Jeff filtered <laughs> Japanese water stuff. I'm really looking forward to it. One of my last remaining prominent canvases of skin. No pressure. Yeah, that's how this whole thing came about, was you asking me to tattoo your hand. And I think since I had already had a couple drinks, yeah. I was like, yeah, sounds good. And then people came up to me afterwards offering to show me pictures of you asking so I could remember the moment because <laughs> not that I was that far gone, but I guess the weight of the moment. I don't know. I just think it was a guy asking you for a tattoo. but Yeah. And then Gabe turned it into an extravaganza. Well, you know, it would have been hard for me to just make the trip out here to get tattooed. Although, eventually, I would have tried, but this is, uh, this gives us a pretense. Yeah. It's business, not just me decorating myself. So I can write off the tickets. I apologize for the cough. It's, it's been around. No, I just need to get over the cold. Got another question here. Um, how long did you discuss the design? Did you do a lot of preliminary sketches and have it all drawn up? Or did you just do it all today? We did most of it today. I had just done the most basic uh, layout idea kind of sketch. A, a sense of where the different elements would go. I didn't want to get too too deep into it without all of us being in the same room. And uh, yeah, we, we probably put a good four or five hours into developing this today.
You know, Jeff's got this approach where, you know, he'll look at a photo of the body part and, and just kind of in his mind flash a bunch of different variations on a theme, put different elements in different places. And so he's kind of doing his thumbnail sketches just mentally. I usually like to scribble out a few things. Like the layout sketch that I had brought today, I had done a couple others that I just didn't, I didn't think made the most out of the, uh, the idea. You know, crab wasn't big enough or whatever. I didn't even bother bringing those. Yeah, it all made sense to me when the picture just that guy showed us just made sense. So it was really easy to follow that lead. Yeah, it made sense because it was the right project for us to be working on collaboratively. No question about how do you do nice waves around some rocks. Another question here. How's the client doing now that you're both 20 to 30 minutes in? Well, I'm just a couple little minutes. Matt, you're rolling? Yeah, I'm doing fine. I'm <laughs> it's probably easiest when they're tattooing at the same time, actually. Well, you know that, that sense you get when you're getting tattooed of, okay, this sucks, but there's progress. Yeah, that progress is awesome, man. Yeah, I can't wait to see the progress when I look in the mirror. You know, you've got that kind of incentive to keep going, but you know. There's so much more getting done than you're used to, you know? See, when we take our first break, there's gonna be such a ridiculously amount of, uh, of work already done. That makes it a lot easier to endure. And then maybe this uh, other question kind of works into that is, how, how do you deal with pain in clients and, uh, and pain management? And if you start a sleeve like this and then the client starts to move and, and that, those sorts of issues. Um, you know, me, honestly, I don't have a lot of, problems with that. Um, partly, I think, is, is our studio setting is extremely relaxed and comfortable and, um, you know, there's no ringing phone or anything like that. But, uh, you know, ibuprofen, Bactine, and, and uh, there's a, a lot of little things, too. Like the way I handle a client, um, like I always make a point of actually physically touching an area before I start tattooing it, like as I'm moving around. So they're not yeah. shocked by, uh, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. You know, little things like that can make a big difference. And just not handling them rough, wiping carefully with a nice wet rag rather than dry wiping or pounding the rag on them. Yeah. Uh, which is easy to forget you're doing that, you know? You're just trying to get it clean, you're looking at the piece, you're thinking about it as you're, as you're going, and you're not thinking necessarily about how hard you're wiping. Usually, uh, we don't even know it until our client says, Man, the wiping is worse than the tattoo. Right. I've experienced that. Another thing is not letting the arm fall asleep. Just being mindful of that because it's another thing that, you know, a lot of clients won't speak up, you know. They don't want to get in the way of progress and, you know, they figure you're rolling. They, they don't want to, you know, get in the way. and. Meanwhile, they're going numb. But you can tell, like, if they're flexing their fingers a lot or whatever. Uh, he just, to look for he those just signs. flexed his fingers. Yep. Yeah. Well, we will uh, definitely make a point of... Okay. Since the subject came up. Yep. Okay, is this a wave coming down in front of this claw here? What's going on with that? Oh uh, no, the claw is going in front of it. Okay. 
Yeah, that wave's like swooping out from underneath the crab. Got it. <clears throat> I think it helps back to the pain. <clears throat> it helps to acknowledge that you understand your client's pain. You know, if, if they're saying things and they're looking for you for some acknowledgement, to ignore them or you know brush it off or just say suck it up. I think they're looking for just an acknowledgement by you to say like, hey, I know this sucks, but it's worth it, and you know, sharing your experience and letting them know that you've been through it. Well, and also by acknowledging that, they know you're sort of working with them on that, you know? Because, yeah. You know, trying to handle them more gently or whatever it takes. I always just give people the bullshit line that I'm going to use my special velvet touch. <laughs> yeah. I have these numbing towels that I refer <laughs> to my clients. When you said that, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Doing larger scale work, I, I ordered these towels so that each client could get their own, you know, their own towel, single use towel that they can bring back, just so I'm not dealing with a bunch of dirty towels and right. And mostly because people were having to get naked and go to the bathroom and stuff like that, so it just gave them something to stay warm, something to cover up with for modesty, and something to go home with. But. It, I started joking that there were numbing towels, so I'd lay it out and I'd be like, you should be fine today, I got my numbing towel out. It uses a special electromagnetic field that interferes with your pain circuitry. It's really just a place where you can, that'll soak up your tears if it gets too painful. Tears, sweat, pee, whatever happens. Here's a question about do you think that there's a hierarchy of pieces you should get tattooed? Uh, that means you know, potentially starting with a sleeve before moving on to a back piece? Um, or do you think that it just depends on the piece and the, and the clients? It really does. You know, the, <coughs> the back is something that I think you don't do casually. Uh, it's a, a thing that people often get stalled on if they're not ready for it and really excited about it because they don't look at it every day. Um, and the back is also, because it's a piece that you don't look at every day, it's really for others, so it's kind of a statement about yourself for others, where a lot of the other work, you know, arms especially, is something you're going to see every day, and so it's, it's art that you're appreciating on a different level than, you know, a back piece. <coughs> if you're still trying to figure out what you're into, um, maybe stay on your legs for starters. Uh, if you're experimenting with different styles and artists and that kind of thing and you're not really sure what you want for your sleeves yet, then stay away from your arms. Um, a lot of us fill up on the arms first and it's the part of you that's the most visible to the world. I mean, unless you get the front of your throat done or whatever. Uh, and so you want it to really be you. So it doesn't hurt to, you know, do a little bit of collecting in places where the sun don't shine before you start getting the big uh, you know, arm work or whatever. But you know, then you've got Matt here. He, he had this little forearm piece that he got. 
And then he went and had Jeff outline his whole torso, down to the knees. Sometimes you just know. I think it's different nowadays with people that have grown up seeing, seeing tattooing now and they kind of, they're already resolved beforehand that they're gonna get a lot of tattoos. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and they might also, you know, very early on, have a real idea of the styles that they're the most attracted to, um, maybe before they even start collecting. I think the hardest one to, to see happen is people getting a really small kind of token piece on a, in a large area. Right. Where it sabotages, you know, late, for later on. I mean, it happens, so. Yep. You incorporate it and it becomes part of your, your life tattoo story that's going on. Yeah. My, my earlier sleeves, I would always, if their shoulder was open or their back, I would bring that sleeve right up onto their, right across their shoulder blade or something, thinking that looked cool. And then later on, try to do a back piece on him, and, and it's his sleeve encroaches. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, wish I didn't do that. Sorry, everyone, that I did that to. <laughs> I had a guy come to me for a sleeve and chest panel, and. Uh, it ended up being sort of an interesting opportunity because he wanted like this crystal lotus uh, on his chest, but because I had the sleeve to work with and I knew I was going to be flowing everything together, I was able to bring it all the way out onto the shoulder a bit. And uh, where if the arm had been done first, I would have had to make it like 30% smaller. So it's nice to be able to plan larger areas ahead that way. You're not so stuck with like the the normal seams that you see in bodysuits. Right. Back to uh, pain management a little bit. Um, when you're dealing with a client who's going through a painful process, do you prefer that they're engaged with you or are you happy to have them to be distracted on their phone or via movies or such? Whatever works. Yeah. Absolutely, whatever works. Um, at that point, it's not about my preferences. It's about what's gonna get them through. And it really is different for everyone. Except for movement. Yeah. If what works is them kicking their foot and shaking their whole body, that kind of sucks. Yeah. Or crying. I mean, I don't mind if tears come out. Sobbing. That's what the towel's for. Yeah. But sobbing or shaking. At that point, I'd rather say, we need to call it or you need to, you need a break or you need something. <clears throat> I'm kind of amazed at how how well almost everybody that I tattoo gets through it. Yeah, these me are too. serious collectors, and some of them might not be super experienced collectors, but they're serious, and you know they're coming a long distance, and they know it's going to be hard to make it out again anytime soon you know we have a a clear objective and I think that can be a real motivator for people they find a way I usually uh, encourage them to bring their own music mix I can I can work to most different kinds of music uh, and if that's gonna make it a lot easier for them then uh, I'm all about it As long as there's notes, it's good. <coughs> you ready for 
for another? Yep. Okay. Um, there has been some debate lately on how a lot of today's color realism is a fraud. Critics have been saying that those tattoos look great, but heal terribly and don't hold. What are your thoughts on the matter? I think it depends on, on the, each tattoo. Um, you know, like I know a lot of Nico's stuff, he's, he's sort of leading the charge with that style, and um, he puts a lot of contrast into his work. Uh, I can't imagine any reason why it wouldn't hold, you know, I mean, it's, it's in there, you know. Um, some, some of the work is just, you know, if you do a light colored foreground shape over a light colored background, you're definitely, you know, running the risk of it not having a lot of impact, uh, especially after a couple, three sunburns. Um, but that's just a matter of how the style is approached, not a matter of the style itself. Uh, yeah, just make sure it's got enough strength to it, and there's there's no reason why it should, you know, heal uh, any worse than, you know, this tattoo, for instance. You know, just because, you know, outlines definitely give a piece a sense uh, a sense of graphic clarity and strength that's different from a no outline piece, even a no outline piece that has a lot of strong black in it. You're just going to get a different look. Uh, but contrast is contrast. If a piece has got a lot of strength to begin with, um, it, it should stay that way. It's not like an outline is this wall of carbon that, you know, if it's not there, everything just bleeds around. Um, there's a lot of room for, you know, interpretation of, of what makes for good contrast. It's, it's, in my opinion, it's about having strong areas of dark and light that are alternating. You know, so you don't have a lot of dark shapes in front of a dark background or light shapes in front of a light background. And whether there's an outline there or not is going to affect the look of it, but it's not going to affect the longevity of it. If it's got enough contrast to begin with. <coughs> I know that in my earlier stuff, I would do really fine lines and little tiny pinups with, you know, eyelashes. <coughs> right. And all that stuff that looked really cool and it could win a tattoo of the day contest and then I would see that a couple years later and those eyelashes have all gone into just kind of a blurred line. So after I saw that, I would just do a nice bold line for the eyelashes. Exactly. And then hope that, now that's going to soften up too. Everything deteriorates, so that's one thing you have to accept about tattoos is they decompose, they deteriorate, they break down over time. and. I think the idea is to come up with something that's going to deteriorate uh, constructively, you know? Yeah. Where uh, it's going <coughs> to cause shading to look a little smoother and that sort of thing. And that, that goes back to contrast. You know, I think a lot of people have a, a misconception about what contrast means and, you know, so they'll just put a lot of black in every shape and every tattoo, you know, thinking that they're giving it contrast, but they're not. I mean, if you're giving your foreground and your background equal amounts of black, you don't have contrast, you just have density. Right. But if you've got, I mean, contrast is about difference. So you put your light shapes and your dark shapes next to each other in a way that's dynamic, large scale, has a strong rhythm when seen from a distance. Is that what your seminar's on tomorrow? That's gonna be a big part of it. Yeah, tomorrow's seminar that I'm giving is called Structure, and it's about optimizing your use of shading, light and dark, color, line versus no line, etc., to uh, give your tattoo work a strong presence when seen from a distance. And, you know, when something looks good from a distance, I think that's also a good test of how it's probably going to look across time, because distance, you know, kind of blurs a piece. And it also uh, is a good way of seeing if, if your work has enough uh, of those large scale alternating areas of dark and light to give it that dynamic, strong quality. You know, I mean, going back to the Japanese style, uh, you know, they've got a tradition of, you know, concentrating black in the background and uh, giving it a movement, you know, wind bars and clouds and that sort of thing in a way that um, when you step back across the room, um, you can really read that movement, and then the foreground shapes uh, would have, you know, that's where you'd have the vibrant color, and, uh, you know, untattooed open areas and that kind of thing. 
And that's, that's contrast, you know, difference, difference between your background and your foreground. I'd like to get that leg real quick. And um, then maybe uh, when you're ready, he could shake out and we could roll him this way a little bit. Mm -hmm. Time, uh, maybe you guys have a story about the weirdest tattoo that you've done with people? It's really personal. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, when you think about it, all tattoos are weird. Yeah. More about the weird tattoo experiences. I don't know. I mean, after a while, it all kind of blends together into something that just sort of makes sense in its own weird way. I think early on, yeah, you get some strange ones. One of my first weird, because I've had plenty of weird weirdos, but I feel kind of bad talking about them. But <laughs> this one lady came in and she wanted her social security number behind her ear um, because she lived, she spent a lot of time out in the woods and she was convinced she was going to be murdered by a crazy person. And, uh, so I had to put her social security number behind her ear, and as it came down below her ear, she wanted me to disguise the numbers legible, but you could put in some flowers. So when someone just saw her, it looked like flowers, but when they discovered her body out in the woods and they, and they searched her, they would see the numbers and realize it's who she was because she didn't want to carry an ID. Wow. Did she have a nice looking tinfoil hat to go with that? Just a little bit. She was strange. And she's probably listening to this right now. Probably. <laughs> <laughs>